Uh, thank you for those who have stayed. Appreciate it. And uh, what an inspirational speech. Tough to follow, i got to believe here. And uh, I thought everybody was coming in for me, but I guess uh, <laughs> they obviously left. All right, we'll make this quick. Um, so I, I started to tell you, I think the key thing, and which is uh, really good for, for me and what he shared, was the fact that getting citizens involved um, and engaging them with that you know, 250 million uh, meters, that's easily what can happen right now. And I think that's what is really important that you take away from the few minutes that I spend with you is don't wait, do it now. You have all the right infrastructure right now to collect, or you're collecting data to allow your citizens to make intelligent decisions about what they're doing with their energy, uh, with their water, and sustaining and making it more conservative um, in their approach and their behaviors. So I won't, I won't uh, drain this. The bottom line is you know about this. We've talked about this. All the uh, team members here uh, to my left have already talked about the various things that are going on in the Indian power sector. Um, lack of policy, uh, things that are happening associated with outdated technologies. But the important piece is, so what is the solution? So I think what I want to share with you is uh, the ease at which you can implement something right now. The point is, is that uh, what you can do is certainly as a result of the uh, collaboration with this group and the team members and all the things that are going on that uh, the India Smart Grid is taking place is driving um, the use of best policy and regulation, which means uh, to one of my colleagues a moment ago, don't build them, reuse them. Um, definitely do the things that you know you can do and have seen been extraordinarily successful in the past. Other things are that um, bring, bring the citizens the ability to be active and engaged immediately. So I know that, that there's not a lot of folks um, that may not have. There are upwards of 750 million. I heard a statistic in regards to Indian citizens who don't have mobile phones. But the point is, is that those who do can inspire those who don't. And I think that's the real importance about how you use the mobile technology is to help them leverage and understand the awareness and through grassroots um, enable people to understand what to do. Education, um, that is part of what happens. And the information that you can get to those citizens that have mobility, it's very valuable so that they can educate others and engage them. I know, and I'm, I think I'm going to be a little bit controversial. You said that we're, uh, there's some places that aren't very interested in saving a few bucks. But I can tell you, if they're not about saving a few dollars, they're absolutely very interested in sustaining energy and um, conserving water. So that is a huge worldwide problem. We only have so much water. And the fact of the matter is it's very expensive to desalinate it and to do any other things about and very costly to filtrate it. So the fact is, is that when you do have it, use it wisely and be very smart about what's happening in your water infrastructure. I'll take a few more of these. I think that's very clear. I think um, there are things that are on the horizon. I heard. Um, uh, Mr. Amory Levins talk about the fact that there are a lot of things that are coming in the, uh, in the future for us. And one of those is infrastructure associated with electric vehicles. And some of my colleagues uh, talked about that as well. The key is you can leverage the use of battery technology in these electric vehicles as well as what's in the home and put that back on the grid or at least at a minimum reduce the requirement for uh, the grid usage and reuse that in existing homes. So how does this happen? We've done this uh, successfully um, hundreds of times. And the reality is, is that this can be done. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what took place at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. There's 1.3 million customers there. They have um, an infrastructure that's old. It's aging. And it's something they absolutely have to upgrade. And why they have to upgrade is because it's constantly, um, there's um, breakage in water lines um, that are all over the front page of the newspaper. But more importantly, how do they help tell their customers about things that take place in that infrastructure. In addition to that, they have a, cur a curtailment uh, goal of 500 megawatts by 2026. You can't do that without engaging your citizens of, the, of their uh, population. So you have to do that not just through word of mouth, not just through the newspaper, but you got to do it with real-time communications and engage them constantly about what it is that they can do and what is happening um, with their, uh, the information that's coming from the utility. As a result of what they're doing, they've had 91% adoption rate of their mobile infrastructure that they delivered through our solution to all of their citizens. And it's made an enormous impact in driving towards their goals associated with curtail curtailment, as well as how they sustain their infrastructure and what they're using. <clears throat> in addition to that, we've also been able to roll out a, a dish, uh, demand response system uh, in a way for them to absolutely save in a very short period of time with just a, a number of 20 uh, commercial industries, they were able to save 18 megawatts of power over three months. So you think about that just by engaging those commercial um, entities and asking them, are you prepared and are you ready to make a change?
They absolutely said, yes, we'll hold on to what the core things are that we need to do. We can turn off air conditioners that are not important. We can turn, out, turn off lights. And as a result, very short window of time, and this was just a pilot program, they saved 18 megawatts of power. And this was done with mobile technology, real-time two-way communication, communicating with them about how you engage. And the last thing was, what was very important, I heard uh, um, you know, our established guest uh, share with us, it's really important to increase the satisfaction of the consumer or the citizens. And this is absolutely happening as a result of you engaging immediately through devices that they have in their hands and what they use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's something that's re uh, realistic and it's something absolutely, as I'll repeat, it's something you can do now. So what I want to do is I just want to share a quick moment. Again, uh, one of my uh, colleagues talked about not talking about cost, but what I can tell you is there's a very important component that you need to think about. And that is, is that when I say talk about doing things now, there are a lot of folks out there, there are a lot of utilities that decide that they want to do this themselves. And they want to build versus buy. And the unfortunate thing about building versus buying some of this, um, this software and some of this technology is that's not reasonable. I've come from a place where I've seen it firsthand. I see it firsthand on a daily basis. And the reality is exactly what you see in that yellow approach. That yellow line up there identifies the fact that deployments are longer, sometimes unrealized, and the fact is, is that over time, they're very, very costly for the utilities to engage. So I would encourage you to think about not asking your team to build it themselves, but to think about how do you leverage technology organizations that are up here uh, sitting next to me and throughout this entire event, and ask them, can you do this for me? I don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's been reinvented. I just want to use it, and I want to use it cost effectively. Another example, and I'll quickly just move through this because it's just a few minutes, but um, I wanted to share with you that, again, customer adoption in, um, in a water utility, saving energy, saving their water, as a result of not having to pump water that they're, um, they've identified through our analytics solution, um, as a result of uh, understanding where leaks are taking place, they've saved a, a boatload of OPEX and the ability to reinvest that into core applications that are important for their utility. They can reinvest that in an infrastructure so that they're not wasting that money through um, uh, leaks that are taking place throughout their infrastructure. How is this done? This is done through a couple of simple solutions. Um, and again, it's leveraging information that's in a portal as well as mobile. And I'll, I'll tell you as well that in the event that even though folks may not have a mobile phone, and by the way, across the world, most people have two or three, which is amazing. Um, but the reality is, is that you can also do this through simple kiosks, places where you can come together as, a, as an organization or as a village, where you can come and just provide one place where they can stop and understand how are they performing, what am I doing differently, and how, I may, how am I making a difference in the, world, um, uh, in the world that I live in. So I think what I'll do is I'll just stop there. I think I've made the impression, I think I've uh, made the connection between what the reality is um, what I skipped over quickly was the fact that you don't only do it with your citizens, you also do it with your field workforce. You can communicate with them easily through the automated uh, systems that you already have. The most important thing is it's taking that data, turning it into intelligent opportunities through humans, and helping them make decisions quickly about what they're going to do versus having to wait or transpose or use paper um, to move forward with their operations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite Pablo Betancourt to, from Huawei Technologies, which is a leading communications company globally. Hey, and I will now meet before, share that for, to reward those who've stuck around, we do have time for a few questions. So yes. Uh, but thank okay. you, Pablo. First of all, namaste, que se hapsa. I am practicing my Hindi, OK? <laughs> So today we are presenting some business cases about Huawei for a better connected smart grid. My name is Pablo, right? I'm a solution architect. I work for the energy department in Huawei Technologies. We are, we are a Chinese company. I will play the video at the end. So uh, Huawei is rank of 228 in the global 500 in 2015. Huawei have more than 170,000 employees, which 79 are engaged in the R&D department, and Huawei annually invest more than 40% of the sales revenue in R&D. Besides that, about our market, uh, last year we have 50, million, 50 billion of revenue. Additionally, we serve one third of the 
world population in ICT, and we serve 45 of top world operators, telecom operators. For Huawei business, uh, just a fast way, carrier business is an operator business like Barty. Uh, we also have the consumer business with the cell phone. Maybe you have here about Huawei for, for the cell phone technology. At the enterprise, the enterprise, we focus in key industries. Which are these key industries? Financials, railway, um, also government. We have more than 140 cases in government. Also energy, which we have uh, 12 cases in the top 20. And we have more than 160 cases in power grid. So in power grid, we have a set or ICT systems in more than 100,000 substations in the world more than 160 power companies, and uh, we have present uh, cases in 60 countries in, around the world. You can see uh, from the footprint. We are going to introduce some cases here. So next, uh, about the smart grid challenges, just a, a, a brief introduction. We have the energy crisis, environmental degradation, power supply, and population growth. So about the energy crisis and environmental degradation of... Uh, so, Pablo, if I can request you to... Next. Focus, yeah. Okay, um, okay. Just in the interest of getting more discussion. Okay, okay, okay. So, thank you. Uh, we we see a smart grid as um, a, the, a core industry for the smart city. Well, we are not going to introduce this. Let's go to the cases, the solution. So, the Huawei solution. We have uh, five solutions: the dispatching cloud data center solution, the solar power plant, the transmission and transformation with the optical equipment, and distribution automation, and the AMI solution. So. The AMI solution, as we know, oh, every, everyone is talking about AMI solution, but Huawei no, don't see just AMI solution. We see the future. Besides AMI, we see AMA is the advanced metering application. So in future, the metering can support not only the meter, but also the IoT service provider. You, the utility company can become a, 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 a ISP service provider. So uh, <laughs> the key of Huawei, of any AMI solution, we have the line loss analysis reduction, the operation cost will lower, we have billing and prepayment and load control and consumption analysis. Okay, so let's talk about China case. So in China, the state grid is controlled by 90% by a state company called the State Grid Corporation of China, which Huawei have more than about 50% of the market share in ICT for this company. Uh, I'm not going to introduce here because no time, but just to, to mention this, this company is a top company in the world because by energy production have more than 3,200 billion kilowatts and more than 200 million users. So let's introduce some case study in the distribution automation and ASX network. So for example, this case is from Brazil, it's similar market to India. So this case is um, Coppel. So this is a power utility company. And what the interest they have, they want to become, uh, they, have to have, they want to have more revenue. So they install Huawei optical solution and they diversify the business and they open a new branch of Coppel, Coppel Telecom. So now, they have two business. They have the power utility and the telecom business. Now they, attend, they are have in one state, more than 399 municipalities, 30,000 kilometers of fiber optics, and they have more than 150,000 homes connected to Huawei devices. So what's the solution? Just a brief introduction here. The solution is the g -Pong solution we use for the smart home. Um, in telecom, it's called the fiber to the home. But besides that, now Huawei is launching the new smart gateway. We will support the home automation, home security, home entertainment, home health, and we will support all the interfaces like CB, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and CT Wave. So in future, we are not talking just about fiber to the home, but a smart home. Uh, the next case study have about the power grid transmission and optical transmission network. So we need higher bandwidth because we have people using cloud computing, LTE, Internet of Things. So the, the transmission power company, let's see this case. The transmission power company can become carrier of carrier. Why? Because Example, this is in Latin America. It's a power transmission company, but they use the OPG double cable, so they install OTN and WDN network, so they become, they open a branch called ISA Internexa, who is a carrier of carriers, and they sell this bandwidth to the local carrier in each country. Not only that, have some, <clears throat> some um, government uh, power grid companies, for example, in Ecuador, they, they build the backbone of power grid, at the same time, they become carrier of carrier in Ecuador. In similar way, in Brazil, we start to have some cases with increasing the bandwidth of the power grid to 100G, 10G, 200G. So what's the solution? The solution is the optical backbone solution where we have the technology, OTN, the WDM, MSTP. For the OTN, is the high bandwidth. We have 100G up to 32 tera. You can grow smoothly, 100, 200, 500G, depending on 
the, if you become carrier of carrier, you don't need to buy the whole bandwidth, you can buy step by step. Second, we have the MST, MSTP solution, is the evolution of the SDH. So this solution is, we have the long haul distance, we support more than 400 kilometers with a station in the middle. So it's a long distance solution. So uh, just to complete the my two last slide, we have the uh, Australia case, similar case with this company, PowerLink, in the state of Queensland. Similar way, they have to support long distance, low latency, high reliability, uh, and they don't have enough bandwidth. So they want to become carrier carrier in Australia, so they buy Huawei, DWDN equipment, and uh, MSTP, MSTP. They have more than 186 DWDM equipment, more than 100 MSTP equipment, and they have unified management system, and now they become carrier of carrier. In similar way, we have in Germany, Eon Edis, also a power grid transmission network. They start with 10G, now they increase 10G to 100G, and then can increase to 8 tera. So they become carrier of carrier in Germany. Uh, just in, this is Huawei portfolio, you know, Huawei have the end-to-end -end ICT solution for power grid. We are, uh, we provide everything for the ICT for in power grid. Uh, for finish, I want to play some video, some small video, just one minute. 60 seconds or less. <laughs> okay, okay. Or if it's not ready, I think we, we can have discussion if ah, it's okay, not okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Bob. Oh, it's ready. Okay. As a global leading ICT solution provider, Huawei serves over 170 countries and one-third of the global population through world-class management experience and process, ranking over 285 in the Fortune Global 500 and reaching 39.5 billion U.S. dollars in sales revenue in 2013. Huawei runs 16 R&D centers and 28 joint innovation centers worldwide. Huawei's R&D departments employ 70 I will request a okay.